Well, I'm looking forward to our time of uh, In the Word together. Today, we're in a, a series this uh, fall titled The Disagreement Series. Just three weeks long, and uh, we've been thinking about this truth that disagreement is an inescapable fact of life. And we've been asking this question, how, how should believers handle disagreement? I positioned this uh, particular message right before the election. <laughs> uh, this is not going to be a, a message on politics in any way, shape, or form, but we're studying the Apostle Paul, and we're looking at his life and how he handled disagreement in the New Testament. And we've gained some important tools, I believe. We learn from his life that as believers, we... We need to, when we find ourselves in disagreement, we need to, one, find common ground. When we're in disagreement, we don't just kind of battle it out. We begin with common ground. What can we both agree on? That's where we start. And then we move to preparing to listen. We don't do all the talking. We, we want to understand, and so we listen. And third, we refuse to posture. We don't uh, give our resume. We don't indicate that we are more important than the other. We refuse to posture. And then last week, I really appreciated what uh, Pastor Dan brought out of Acts 15. He shared with us that the commodity of believers is relationships. That's our product. If we were a business, what does the church produce? The church produces relationships. And the harmony of those relationships, according to Jesus, is what will convince the world that God, in fact, sent his son. And so the commodity of, of believers is relationships. We seek to protect them and to preserve them. Today, we're going to look once again at the life of the Apostle Paul. And last week, I felt that Dan asked a very important question. Was Paul perfect? And of course, I imagine probably every one of us would say, no, he was not perfect. No one is perfect. But isn't it the truth that because Paul wrote probably half of the New, the New Testament, that we tend to elevate him to this place of perfection? We reason that it's in the Bible, so it must be ideal. Paul must be ideal. And, and here's the thing. If Paul is perfect, then we will believe that what he says is always a bit out of reach for us because we're not perfect. We'll always have that ability to say, well, that's the Apostle Paul, and I'm not Paul. But the truth is that Paul was not perfect. I'd like you to see that at least in one verse, uh, Titus chapter 1, a couple verses, 12 and 13. Paul is uh, referring to those who are not Jews in Crete, and he says about the Cretans, even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And then this is what Paul says, this testimony is true. <laughs> he agrees. And we sort of cringe. I mean, in just, in just a few words, he profiles an entire group of people. We would use the word discrimination. We would use the word prejudice. Sort of like lumping an entire ethnicity into one category and judging them. They're all this way. And it's wrong. And there are other examples in Scripture as well on other themes regarding Paul, but we see that Paul was not perfect. Paul was a human filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't miss this. 
When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it does not mean that you become perfect. You still have your personality. You still have your propensities to go out of bounds here or there. To have the indwelling Holy Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit is to be a work in progress. Paul wrote in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What's Paul saying? He's acknowledging that believers are a work in progress. When you place your faith in Jesus, you do not become perfect in all of your actions. You are a work in progress. In fact, let's just do this for, for just a moment. Work with me here. Uh, turn to the person next to you, and kids, you can do this towards your parents as well. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a real piece of work. All right, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead and do that. Say it to one another. You've been wanting to say it for a long time. You're a real piece of work. You're a real piece of work, Dad. And it's true. We're all a work in progress. And he who began is going to complete. It's what we call sanctification. It's the process of becoming like Christ. It's not a light switch. It doesn't happen all at once and the room is filled with light. It's the process of growth. And it's growth in a direction. It's very important that we see that the Apostle Paul is in that same process. He is growing in a direction. Now, uh, there are not very many people writing about this. It's almost imperceptible. But I believe that we can see across the span of Paul's life that he is growing in a direction. And I want you to observe with me the direction of that growth. As we're going along here and we're observing Paul's life, ask yourself, what is the direction of his growth? First, let's, let's note that Paul became a follower of Christ at about age 30. He was not one of the disciples of Jesus at the time. Jesus had already ascended into heaven. His name was actually Saul at the time. And he himself was devoted to persecuting the church. Persecuting anyone who had anything to do with the, with the way of Jesus. But Acts chapter 9 tells us that he's walking down the road and, and, and as he's walking down the road, this light from heaven comes and it puts him right on his knees, right on the ground. And in that light, he experiences a vision of Jesus. He talks to Jesus. And long story short, he becomes completely convinced of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And Paul does a complete 180 and becomes no longer a persecutor of the church, but a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus. That is his beginning. He starts at about the age of 30. Roughly 15 years later, Paul wrote Galatians about the age of 45. In chapter 1, we hear Paul talking about his former way of life, how he intensely persecuted the church of God and even tried to destroy it and then destroy its members. In verse 14 of that first chapter, 
he admits that he was extremely zealous about persecuting the church. Well, you know, to be full of zeal, that can be a, actually a good thing. I mean, that's uh, enthusiastic. It's passionate. But to be extremely zealous can sort of be over the top and not good. That's fanatical. That's obsessive. You will do this. I'm going to make you do this. And my question is, that was his former way of life. My question is, when he became a follower of Jesus, did that extreme zeal just go away? I don't think so. Galatians chapter 2, when, when Paul uh, disagreed with Peter, who was an apostle, Paul declares in verse 11, we'll put it up on the screen, he says, I oppose Peter to his face. <laughs> because he was clearly in the wrong. I mean, granted, it was a very important issue and Paul was right. But forget about finding common ground. <laughs> forget about listening. Forget no posturing. It wasn't let's sit down and reason together. It was extremely zealous. I oppose Paul to his face. It's this, I am an apostle and you will listen to me. But remember, Paul is an apostle. And he's a work in process. Just like you and me. His beginning posture was, I am an apostle. You will listen to me. But he's a work in progress. And he's growing in a direction. What is that direction? Well, roughly five years later, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians at about the age of 50. What has happened in his life in these past five years? Are we able to observe it even briefly in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, where Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I look at this passage in Galatians and I, I feel like it seems different to me. No longer I am an apostle. No longer I am the one who knows and in your face, Peter. Now it's I am the least of the apostles. What is the direction of Paul's growth? Roughly five years later, Paul wrote Ephesians about the age of 55. And I wonder, will we be able to observe any growth in his life in these last five years since he turned 50? I believe we can. He writes in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace has, was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This, is, this was uh, not I am the least of the apostles. This time, it's I am less than the least of all God's people. Do you see the direction that this is heading? In the early days, it's I am equal with you, Peter. Five years later, I am the least of the apostles. Five years later, I am less than the least of all God's people. There is a direction to this growth. Roughly five years later, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, now at about the age of 60, and I wonder again, will we be able to observe any new growth in Paul? He writes in chapter 1, verse 15, 
Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Do you see the direction of Paul's growth? I am an apostle. I am the least of the apostles. I am less than the least of all God's people. I am the worst of all sinners. Three years later, Paul was executed in Rome at the age of 63. And I believe as we look at Paul's life that spans these 33 years from the time he came to faith in Christ. It seems that from the time God reveals Jesus to you, the trajectory of growth is downward. You become more aware of his greatness. You become more aware of your own sinfulness. And this is the direction of growth in the Christian life. A while back, I, I saw a statistic that said that this about ministers. Eight out of ten ministers today would choose some other vocation if they were to do it over again. I wondered if that could even be true. I mean, does that mean that eight out of ten ministers today believe that they're in the wrong vocation? And by the way, I just want to kind of push the pause button here and say that that uh, ministry, and I can speak on behalf of the whole staff because we agree about this together, but ministry at Mac is such a pleasure. Um, you're, you're just a delightful people to lead. And I was reminded of that again uh, in the month of October. Somebody in the nation came up with October as Pastor Appreciation Month. I don't know who that was or why they did it, but I like it. And uh, during the month of October, uh, various people brought in baked goods to the office, and we grazed on those through the week as a staff. All right, usually they came on one day and they were gone on the same day. But on the end of the month of October, I stood on the scale and I realized that in one month I had gained five pounds just, just eating baked goods. There's, there's now more of me to appreciate. But, and yet here is this statistic. Eight of ten ministers today would choose some other vocation if they were to do it over again. Whatever that stat is indicating, I can tell you it's not true of me. I love pastoral ministry. It's been the joy of my life. But I will say that similar to Paul, the trajectory over the years has been a downward growth. When I first got out of college in my early 20s, I I wanted to change my local world. I figured, I've got a ministry degree. Let's do this. And, and I really believed it could happen. But over the years, the, the gap between my view of Christ and my view of myself has increased. I am more amazed at Him and I am less impressed with me. More aware of my desperate need of Him. More aware of my own inadequacies. Completely amazed that He would ever use me. And with all of my heart, I believe that is growth.
the trajectory of growth that we're observing in the Apostle Paul is what Scripture calls humility. This process of sanctification, this process of growth, is a movement toward humility. Humility literally means to prop up. It doesn't mean that we prop up God as if God were going to tip over. No, humility is seeing myself as under, not above. I see myself as under God. I exalt Him. I exalt Christ. And of course, the opposite of humility is what? Say it out loud, would you? Pride. Pride is where I see myself as above. I see myself as exalted. Above others. Smarter than others. Better than others. I'm the one who knows. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And the very next verse, therefore, submit yourselves then to God. Come under Him. Exalt Him. And so, the difference between humility and pride is the direction that I'm looking. If I'm looking up and exalting Him and acknowledging Him and living under Him, that's humility. If I'm looking down and posturing myself as above and the one who knows, that's pride. And by the way, there's a false humility. And that's where you're not propping up, you're not looking up, but rather you're only looking in. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'm useless. And that's false humility. True humility looks within and at the same time looks with a gaze which is to Christ. I marvel at His grace. I marvel at His willingness to forgive me and to live in me and include me in His family and give me purpose for living. I marvel at Him given what I know about myself. That's humility. And that is what we see in the downward growth of the Apostle Paul. Now, what does any of this have to do with disagreement? Remember, disagreement is an inescapable fact of life. It's going to happen. It is happening. Some of you are maybe in disagreement right now, embroiled in it in your life. And to the extent that you are growing in humility, to the extent that you see yourself under Christ Jesus, you will increasingly reach for these tools that we talked about here earlier. To the extent that you see yourself as under Christ and you exalt Him, you value relationships. Relationships cannot be compromised because that's the way the world will decide whether or not God actually sent His Son. Not based on your knowledge or my knowledge, based on relationships. And so to the extent that you are under Christ, you will reach for these tools when it comes to disagreement. When you disagree, you will decide we've got to begin with common ground. I need to prepare myself to listen 
to understand what this person is saying. I must refuse to posture because that will destroy relationships. And you can take this position. Why? Because you know Christ is in control. So you don't need to be. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to protect. On the other hand, to the extent that you are proud, to the extent that you feel you must be in charge, your disagreements will be protracted. They'll just go on and on. Let me ask you, do you have any protracted disagreements? My hope in asking that question is, as we conclude this series, is that you would be encouraged. He who began is going to complete. You and I are a real piece of work. Paul was a work in progress. I am a work in progress. You are a work in progress. Therefore, submit yourselves to God. You know, I was uh, thinking this week and posing this uh, question in my own mind. We're going to put it up on the screen, but what is the path to humility? What is the path to humility? You know, it is God's work. God is going to do a work in you. It's His work. But if I were to pursue a path to humility, what would I seek? And here's the answer, I believe. A fresh vision of Christ. If I were to seek a path to humility, it would be a fresh vision of Christ. Paul had that first encounter with Jesus and it was on that road and it was a, a light and he interacted with Jesus and it transformed him. Didn't make him perfect, but it was a beginning. And we see oftentimes in, in the book of Revelation this instruction of, of Jesus to the churches that he might see something that's going on in their life and what is his, what is his recommendation what is his instruction? You need to go back to the beginning. What you experienced at first, what was that? It was a revelation of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus today, you had a beginning. You saw Jesus. You understood him. He revealed himself to you so that you knew who he was and it compelled you to surrender your life to him. And if you find yourself embroiled in disagreement, God is opening a door for you to be further shaped. He is going to complete the work. The question is, are you going to submit yourself to Him? Are you going to come under Him where you're confident that He is going to work this out? Or are you going to be proud and tell yourself, I've got to win. See, a fresh vision of Jesus will always humble you. It will always bring you to your knees. And I'm thinking here today, maybe, maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've uh, never come to that place where you said, here I am. Have mercy on me, God, a sinner. You've never come to that place. I want you to have a vision of Jesus. I want all of us to have a vision of Jesus. We're going to look in, the, in at uh, Philippians chapter 2. I'd love for this to serve as um, a vision of Jesus for you. Because that's what it's going to take for us to grow. And I want you to see in 
in uh, Philippians chapter 2, these few verses that I'm going to read before we participate in communion together. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he was equal with God. It's just he didn't feel he had to grasp that. He didn't feel he had to hang on to that. He was willing to pay a price. He was willing to, as it were, lose. And so he lets go. who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is divine humility. And that's the picture that you need to see as you face disagreement. And that's the picture you need to see if you are ever to come into God's family. I'm going to ask our worship team to come. I'm going to ask Pastor Dan to come and join me. We come to this time that we call communion, and up front here are these elements that represent this picture that we just saw. It's a picture of Jesus who is equal with God, one of the three persons of the Godhead, who decides that Equality with God is not something to hang on to. And so he lets go. There's no disagreement about it. He knows there's going to be a price to pay. And he pays it. And he comes down to earth and his body is broken and his blood is shed in order to make a way for each of us to come into his family. That's what Jesus did. He made a way for each one of us to come into Jesus' family. And so when we come up here this morning, what we are doing and we're coming up, we're making a statement of faith, as it were. We're, we're saying, this community of believers knows that the way to Jesus or the way to God is through Jesus, his broken body, his shed blood. But you're also making a statement of faith that I believe it individually. I believe this for me. I want to say to you today, you can come up here even if you've never followed Jesus, but in coming up here to take some bread and some juice, you would be saying, as of today, I believe. I believe. And I'm so grateful to Jesus. I exalt him today. So we invite you to come as we sing and we invite you to come as, as you are ready to. You can partake, receive these elements and then return to your seat as we conclude worshiping together.